Hello and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Lee Langford, I'm a Research Director at Harris Interactive and I'll be one of your hosts today as we update you on the latest insights from Social Life, our survey tracking social media use in the UK. And I'm Georgiana Brown, a Research Manager at Harris where I focus on financial services, consumer and retail research. The webcast today will last about 25 minutes. I'm going to kick things off and then hand over to Georgiana about halfway in. If you have any questions for us at all during the broadcast, please type them into the comments box on your screen and we'll get back to you as soon as we finish. So what's new in the social media world? One of the ongoing themes of the last few months has been the abuse suffered by athletes and how they've responded to this. Elise Christie was trolled on Twitter after inadvertently taking out a rival speed skater at the Sochi Winter Olympics. And just prior to this, Olympic gymnast Beth Tweddle suffered nasty abuse in a live Q&A session also on Twitter. Uh, this is nothing new of course. There have been other infamous examples in, in recent years with Tom Daly, Rebecca Adlington, probably the highest profile cases. One response to this is to close down social media accounts, as in the cases of Christie and Adlington. But others have continued to embrace social media and all the benefits that this can bring, with Daly recently appearing on YouTube to let the world know about his relationship with a man and he received great support from many in the sporting world and beyond. Clearly there's a fine balance to be drawn between the benefits, financial and otherwise, that athletes can gain from social media exposure and the downsides of potential abuse and one that will continue to tax sport governing bodies as well as individual sports stars over the coming years. And social media trolling doesn't just affect the rich and famous. We reported in our previous Social Live webinar and in various recent press releases that one in 12 UK social media users and almost one in five young women have suffered serious social media abuse. Now, sticking with the celebrity theme, we know from previous social media research that following celebrities is a big attraction for many social media users. Here's a comment from a 30-year-old woman who belongs to the socially active user segment that we've identified, outlining why she loves Twitter. In our most recent Social Life survey in January, we found that a third of all social media users follow celebrities. The incidence is much higher among younger people, peaking at 59% among 16 to 24 year old females. We thought it would be interesting to check on which celebs are popular right now, and so we asked people to list the three celebrities that they've started following most recently. And here you can see that the standout names are Stephen Fry, David Beckham, which is actually not very different from when we first asked this question back in March 2013. If we group the names into categories, the chart's a little easier to read. Sportsmen, and it typically is sportsmen, form one big category in the bottom left here, and US women tend to dominate when it comes to pop music in the bottom right. Since we last asked about celebrities about a year ago, Kim Kardashian, Vin Diesel are the big movers, and even the Prime Minister is in the mix now and on a par with the likes of Brad Pitt, Anton Deck, and very funny James Blunt. What else has been in the news? Well, social media is now very clearly in the mainstream, with Birdseye announcing recently a new potato-based product called Mashtags, to the amusement of many uh, social media commentators. And of course, social media is now super corporate. Nokia powered the social wall at the recent Brit Awards ceremony, engaging in social conversation with fans in the lead-up, during and after the show, in an attempt to plug no Nokia Mix Radio. The Brits itself made its usual massive media splash, most notably this year for the 4 million tweets during the broadcast, which doubled the number uh, of the previous year and beat the record for any British TV show of any kind. And continuing with the corporate theme at award ceremonies, another Twitter record was beaten at the Oscars, where Ellen DeGeneres organised an apparently not so spontaneous selfie taken on a Galaxy Note 3 supplied by Samsung, one of the show's main sponsors. The photo crashed Twitter by re being retweeted more than a million times less than an hour and smashing the previous record set by Barack Obama after his re-election in 2012. The jury's out uh, still, however, on the quality of the images, so this could ultimately backfire on Samsung. Social media is not all about Twitter, of course. Elsewhere, brands have now started using Snapchat, the newest social platform on the block, in interesting ways, and demonstrating that it's not just for kids too. In the US, McDonald's have enlisted basketball star LeBron James to promote its new line of burgers, 
in a series of 10 second snaps. In the UK, Betfair, the online betting exchange, has recently started using Snapchat to offer self-destructing odds to punters. And other brands have also been active in the UK, including MTV, promoting Geordie Shaw, um, and the retailer Cooperative Electrical claimed the first UK use of Snapchat with a campaign offering discounts on laptops to students. We'll return to Snapchat later when we look at how awareness and usage of social media platforms has changed in the last few months. But arguably, the biggest social media news story of the last few months has been the prediction from researchers at Princeton University that Facebook will have lost 80% of its user base in three years' time. The forecast of impending doom comes from um, comparing its growth curve to that of an infectious disease and lots of other very complex data that I won't go into here. Not surprisingly, the forecast has been rigorously challenged by many and not just by Facebook. Our own data, as we'll see shortly, points to Facebook being in pretty, pretty rude health right now. Having said this, things can change very quickly and Facebook's recent market activity, offering $3 billion for competitor Snapchat, an offer that was declined, and subsequently being more successful with a $19 billion bid for the messaging service WhatsApp, are clear indications that it feels under some pressure, particularly when it comes to retaining the youth audience. Now let's have a look at the latest statistics generated by our Social Life Monitor just a month or so ago in January. In September, we reported that Snapchat was beginning to establish itself as well as movement from other up-and-coming brands like Vine and Instagram. So has Snapchat managed to break into the big four brands or does it still have some way to go? The simple answer is that it's still got quite a way to go. Here we're looking at data from our representative sample of over 3,000 social media users aged 11 and above. Awareness of emerging platforms Snapchat and Vine is building quickly. Snapchat, for example, is up 15% between September and January. But awareness of chat, uh, Snapchat and Vine is still confined to a minority of users. More established platforms, including Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, are also continuing to build awareness, although their rate of growth is slowing a little. Ask FM, the anonymous site which featured heavily in the news in the middle of 2013 for mainly negative reasons, has since been less prominent in the news and sees the biggest fall in awareness in January. Let's move on to look at how account membership has changed in the last few months. Here we see significant growth in membership of Snapchat, Instagram and LinkedIn. A sure sign that Instagram has become more mainstream is the recent announcement that the Dalai Lama can now be listed among its international user base. Google Plus is the only one of the big four platforms to see membership grow, with Facebook, YouTube and Twitter all down very marginally since September. But it's when we get to active account use, by which we mean use in the last 30 days, that we continue to see the magnitude of Facebook's lead over other platforms. Google Plus again sees growth, but remains behind Twitter in fourth position. And the lack of growth in active use of Twitter correlates with news that Twitter's monthly active user base is growing slowly on an international scale too, despite very strong revenue growth and a commitment from Dick Costolo to build a product that's accessible to everybody. Snapchat, Instagram and Spotify have all grown their active user bases significantly, but they still have a minority reach among all social media users. If we look at the average number of accounts users are active on, it's clear that 16 to 24 year olds are most active overall, and that along with 25 to 34 year olds, they're mainly responsible for driving up the overall numbers in September. Active use of social media platforms is relatively static among other age groups. So we thought it'd be interesting to focus on this more active 16 to 34 year old demographic who are often referred to as millennials and look at which platforms are seeing greatest uplift. In fact, millennials are driving up active use of a range of sites, most visible here being Google+, Snapchat, Instagram and Spotify. Active use of Snapchat and Instagram is twice as high among this demographic as among the overall population. And both of these platforms are also higher up the ranking in the league table too. We quantify the number of posts, tweets, snaps, etc. that each user makes on each platform each month. The average total volume across all platforms in January was 37. Pretty consistent with what we saw in September and clearly some platforms are used more frequently than others. 
as we see here on the left. Snapchat has the highest content frequency among those who use it, followed closely by Facebook, and then Twitter and Instagram. But if we factor in site usage overall, as we've done on the right-hand side here, we can see that Facebook, Twitter and YouTube account for the vast majority of all original content, and Facebook really stands out with 44%. However, if we compare the January data to how things look back in September, Facebook's share of voice has fallen by over 4%, and this has been lost to up-and-coming platforms Snapchat and Instagram. So is Facebook losing its way? Another way we monitor this is to check which platforms users prioritise over others. Facebook remains the most important social media site for three quarters of those who use it, and there's no change here since September. Other popular sites tend to be second or third choices, or even further down the chain in the case of Instagram and Snapchat, which tend to be used by those who are active on lots of sites. If we look at the same data at aggregate level, Facebook remains the most important social media site for over three-fifths of social media users. And Facebook's even top for 52% of 11 to 15-year-olds, the audience that's supposedly leaving Facebook en masse. Now, this is hardly the look of a brand that's set to have all but disappeared in three years' time. But stranger things have happened, of course. As well as looking at the platforms consumers use, we are also tracking the devices they use to access them. And this provides some pointers on how we want to use social media and perhaps the types of platform we will be using more in the future. In September, we reported that there had been relatively little change in device usage during 2013. And in January, portable laptops have remained the most popular device consumers use to access social media, with 58% connecting this way. However, January does see significant changes, with mobile phone use up by 3%, and tablet use up by a massive 7%. Over one in four social media users now connect via tablet, which will in part be down to increasing ownership of tablet computers themselves following Christmas gifting. On the decline, fixed PCs are now used to connect by less than half of social media users. Tablet use is highest amongst 11 to 15 year olds at 40%, whilst mobile use is highest amongst 16 to 24 year olds at 78%. Social media then is becoming something that we increasingly engage with whilst out and about. We are also multitasking more, using smartphones and tablets to connect whilst doing something else at the same time, such as watching TV. This clearly does have implications for all the big platforms, and perhaps for Facebook more than others. We now want to spend some time focusing on brands in social media. In a previous wave of social life, we asked participants to tell us which brands they follow or more accurately engage with on social media. We didn't prompt them, and a range of brands was mentioned, spanning consumer electronics, supermarkets, sportswear, and FMCG. In January, we prompted participants with the list of 67 brands that you see here, and we asked a number of questions about social media engagement with these brands. We selected the brands based on those selected spontaneously by the greatest numbers in our previous survey. Firstly, we asked which brands participants interact with and on which social media platforms. Just under half told us they interact with any of these brands, a figure that varies considerably by age group, from 22% of those aged 65 and above, rising to 73% amongst 16 to 24 year olds. It is probably no coincidence that our top four brands featured three, Amazon, Google and eBay, that have emerged in the digital era, and another, the BBC, that has truly embraced social media in recent times. We are only showing the top 10 brands here, but others that appear lower down the ladder include financial services providers, mobile network operators, well-known high street names, other FMCG brands, fast food chains, automotive brands and football clubs. Please do get in touch with us if you would like to know just where your brand appears in the list or if you'd like to add your brand to the next wave of social life. Do things look any different if we split the data by gender and age group? Well, for the BBC and Amazon, the answer is no, as they feature in the top two across all demographics. Some other brands do come more into the picture, however, if we look at specific groups, including PlayStation cropping up amongst younger men, with Tesco and ITV appearing in the list amongst the older age groups. We asked those who interact with each brand we featured in our research a number of follow-up questions. 
Firstly, we looked at which platforms the consumers engage with them, and Facebook tends to dominate for all brands. The figures we are sharing here, showing Facebook responsible for over half of all social media interactions, relate to the top 10 brands we have shown you. Google+, Twitter and YouTube are the only other platforms that see any significant engagement for our top 10 brands, although Vine does come into play more for some of the brands that we have not featured today. We also looked at how consumers interact with brands on social media. The most common ways are simply through liking their posts or their product or service offers. In fact, most types of brand interaction are positive. Next up on the top row here are watching video content, taking part in competitions and signing up to a fan page. On the bottom row, we have 11% engaging by taking up a social media deal or special offer and then 9% buying something via a link on a social media site, submitting a product review or following a blog. Finally, we get to a negative type of interaction, with 9% complaining to a brand's customer services team. This chart shows you the total picture across the featured brands, but naturally we interact with different brands in different ways on social media. Here we're looking again at the top 10 brands our participants engage with and the chart highlights some interesting differences. Watching video content stands out for the BBC, Google and PlayStation. Engagement with Tesco and Cadbury is most likely to involve competitions. For Coca-Cola and Samsung, it's more about liking products or posts, whilst for Amazon and eBay, making a purchase and writing a product review come into play more. Finally, we asked for an overall assessment of the quality of social media engagement with each brand using a 10-point awful to brilliant scale. On the face of it, the overall average score of 7.3 out of 10 across all 67 brands sounds quite good, doesn't it? But here's a reminder of some analysis we have shared previously. It demonstrates that a score of 7 or thereabouts is really only treading water and having very little impact on consumers' willingness to promote a brand to others. Brands really need to be targeting a minimum social media score of 8 out of 10 to have a significant positive impact on their NPS. And if they can get to 9 or 10 out of 10, NPS goes through the roof. Here's the full breakdown for our brands. A full point separates the strongest from the weakest social media performers. The weakest brands are falling below the treading water benchmark. And the very strongest performers, PlayStation, Apple and Coca-Cola, are all pushing towards an average of 8 out of 10. Another point worth noting here is that the media and digital era brands which featured strongly in terms of social media engagement levels, that is by having the greatest proportion of people engaging with them, have dropped out of or fallen down the top 10 in this list, which focuses on the quality of that engagement and have been replaced instead by consumer electronics and sports brands. Again, if you're interested in seeing where your brand sits against these benchmarks, please do get in touch with us. We have been mainly focusing on the positive side of social media engagement with brands so far, but we're also tracking the more negative side, which includes bash tagging. This is where consumers use social media to vent frustration at dodgy products or experiences of poor service, publicly naming and shaming the companies they hold responsible. So how many of us have actually complained about service providers on social media? And who are we complaining about? Well, the reality is that most social media users never complain about service providers in this way at all. However, 28% of us have done so, and these figures are a little up since September, with one in five of us now doing so now and again, up 3%. Just 8% complain in this way whenever they have a problem. Companies might find it useful to know that the incidence increases significantly amongst heavier social media users, peaking at 43% amongst 16 to 24 year old males. And active Twitter users are also much more likely than average to complain. We asked those who do use social media in this way to tell us which type of service providers they complain about most often via social media. Mobile network operators tops the list, just ahead of internet service providers and utility companies are then in third place. Despite some news grabbing stories about card and app failures and the consequent customer dissatisfaction, 
we see that relatively few people complain most about financial services providers in comparison. When we ask people for the name of the specific company that they complained about most often, we can see that it's mobile network operators and internet service providers that dominate, with Sky emerging as the company most complained about, followed by BT, then British Gas and Virgin Media. The inclusion of Virgin Trains in this list is an indication that train operating companies make up the majority of the other mentions that we featured on the previous chart. It's interesting to note that whilst some are more complained about than others, all of the main mobile network operators, internet service providers and utilities providers appear on this chart. And whilst the size is not always proportional to their market share, industry dissatisfaction goes across the board and this is reflected in bash tagging. Little wonder then that companies are increasingly investing in social media monitoring and both looking out for and crucially responding quickly to complaints made via social networks. If only my train operator followed suit. A topic that we have investigated for the first time in January is social media hacking. In December, it was reported that hackers had stolen usernames and passwords for nearly 2 million accounts at Facebook, Google, Twitter, and other sites around the world. On New Year's Eve, Snapchat was hacked, with the hackers revealing more than 4.5 million usernames and phone numbers in a website they deliberately set up to highlight flaws in Snapchat's security measures. And apparently nobody is safe from hacking, with even Mark Zuckerberg suffering an embarrassing breach of his private Facebook page in the past. So we wanted to quantify just how big a deal hacking really is for UK social media users. We found that overall, one in 10 UK social media users has ever had an account hacked. But this average figure masks significant demographic differences. At one end of the spectrum, we see almost one in five 16 to 24 year old women have been hacked. Of course, they also have more social media accounts than average. At the other end of the scale, just 1% of men aged 65 and over have ever been hacked. Many of these will only be registered with Facebook. We asked which sites have been hacked, and it's no surprise to see Facebook at the top of the list, given that it is the site that most people have an account with. But if we look at these incidences as a proportion of people registered with each platform, Facebook and Twitter appear to be more vulnerable, with around 8% of Facebook and Twitter users having been hacked, compared with only 3% of Google Plus and YouTube users. OK, so let's round things off with a one minute wrap up. The first key point to emerge from our January data is that although Facebook and the other big four sites are holding steady in terms of their usage bases, other platforms, in particular Instagram and Snapchat, are beginning to, and forgive the pun please, beginning to snap at their heels, particularly among the important 16 to 34 year old demographic. Secondly, we're definitely witnessing changes in social media device usage with smaller, more mobile devices beginning to take over from fixed, larger devices. And this has implications clearly for which uh, platforms brands should be investing in, both from a Marcoms and a customer service perspective too, as they build their social media footprint in 2014 and beyond. And finally, although most brands' social media performance is okay, it's definitely a case of could do better if they're looking to drive up consumers' willingness to recommend based on social media engagement. That's all from us today. Thanks for taking time out to join us, and we hope you found the session interesting and useful. A fuller report will be sent to you in the next couple of weeks, so please keep an eye out for this, and obviously feel free to share it with any colleagues. If you'd like more detail on any of the points that we've covered today, do please get in touch. Our contact details will be on screen shortly. The next wave of social life is scheduled to take place in May, if you've got any social media topics you'd like us to investigate, please get in touch. But for now, goodbye. Goodbye.